Well, we are stepping into Luke, and I feel like, man, if that's what this is going to be like, we should have got to Luke a long time ago. Um, so well, let me tell you a little bit about Luke. And, and as you guys uh, may know, the word that the Lord gave us over this year is our first love, that he's calling us back. I want you to return to me, return to your first love. You've got lots of great works. You've been faithful in a lot of ways, and I'm super proud of you. However, this one thing I want you to shift, I want you to return to your first love. So as we're reading through Luke, I want you to remember this, that God is calling this family, this tribe, back to our first love. So we're looking, I want you to look at it through those eyes of first love, right? It's like, wow, God, remember when you first showed up. So we're going to see Jesus come on the scene. We're going to see the fullness of God coming through and, and fulfilling prophecies. We're going to see the words of Christ calling us to the Father and the demonstration of the Father's heart in Jesus. And I, and I want us, as we're going through this, keep looking at it through that lens of like, my God, I want to re return to you with my whole heart. I want to bring you all of my self again. I want to respond to you as I did at the first. Amen? All right. So let me give you a little backdrop on, on, on Luke here. Uh, how many of you read chapters one and two this week? Well done. I have been loving this. I've been, I, uh, I incorporated it into my daily rhythms of meditation. And so I've just been like picking a scripture. I've re I read through, I pick a scripture, and then I just meditate on it, you know? And, and I, I've been doing like the word emphasis meditation. I've been getting so much out of, of doing that. You guys know what I'm talking about? Where you, where you just take that scripture and it's like, God is good. And you're like, God is good. God is good. God is good. Good. And by the time I get through that scripture of going through and emphasizing all of them, by the time I'm ready to write down a few observations, my heart is just full. I'm just so aware of his presence. How many of you guys like word emphasis meditation when you spend time in the scriptures? How many of you are getting excited just hearing about it? It's really powerful. It really helps to help you engage with a, with a scripture and be able to be aware of his presence and to really soak in it. And it's biblical, actually. It's biblical to meditate on the scriptures. So that was a freebie. I want to draw your attention to this insert. It was in your bulletin, and there are more on the back table. This has the reading schedule for Luke as we're going through it, and it also has some beautiful artwork. And I cannot remember the name of the artist, but uh, you're going to see a little more of that when Jason gets here. He'll remember the name of the artist. But at any rate, please pick one of these up on your way out. It's got the reading schedule, and, um, and we'll be spending the next 12 weeks going through the 24 chapters of Luke. Father, I thank you for these remaining 25 minutes that I have. Lord, I really want to do a great job of giving this tribe everything that would be helpful for us to grow in you today. Lord, I'm really not interested in adding to that, but I certainly don't want to miss any of the time I get. So by your Holy Spirit, Lord, bless this time and let us grow in you in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke was written um, by a gentleman named Luke, and he was a physician. Um, he was a co-worker with the Apostle Paul, uh, and he also was a Gentile. The other Gospels are all written by Israelites, by Jews, and this is actually from a Gentile, which is pretty interesting, and you see that in the writing, that, that Luke is excited about the fact that the Gospel has come to the Gentiles, so he, he has, uh, he's also a historian. So he's coming from a very historical, it's, it's almost like, um, well, he does, he writes it from a historical perspective because he's really wanting to say, listen, this is what happened. I checked it out. I talked to eyewitnesses. I corroborated their stories. I'm giving you a historical, factual account. Not that the other gospels weren't, but their emphasis wasn't the same. So this is the historical emphasis with Luke. He's believed to have written it around uh, A.D. 60 to 63. It could have been written even as late as maybe A.D. 80, but there's more evidence that it was more in the 60 to 63 um, that, uh, that he wrote it. And Luke wrote both Luke and Acts. So these are two parts of actually one book. They're addressed to most excellent Theophilus. We don't actually know who Theophilus was. Um, he could have been an unbeliever who was interested in Christianity or maybe someone who sponsored the publication. That was a normal thing in those days was you would get somebody to sponsor the publication and distribution of an important piece of literature and that was the way you showed honor to that person. So even though it was written for lots of people, you would mention the person that sponsored it. 
It could have been uh, a new Christian who is in need of further instruction, or perhaps, and there's some pretty cool evidence for this, um, but uh, that it also could have been actually to a Roman official who was overseeing the Apostle Paul's trial, because... um, uh, because uh, Luke's, Luke's second book in Acts actually ends with Paul on trial waiting, uh, waiting, or waiting for his trial is how, how the book of Acts ends. So these are some things that we know. But regardless, we know that the gospel of Luke was spoken for all believers everywhere in the ho- and, and in the hope that all people would become believers and receive Christ. Luke himself very much a believer and wanting to see us embrace Jesus, our Messiah. So praise God, huh? There are, um, there are a few themes here in Luke uh, that you can be aware of. There's kind of these main sort of five themes. The first one is that Luke comes at this from, from, the, from the premise of the promise fulfillment that happened in Christ Jesus. That, that when Christ came, he's fulfilling all the promises of the Torah, of the Old Testament. He's coming in all those prophecies, they come together in Jesus Christ. And Luke really, he goes through, and you'll see this as we go through this, and he's saying, look, most excellent Theophilus, Here's what was said about Jesus, and here's how he made that happen. Here's where this prophecy was that was eons old, and look, Jesus matches it exactly. He fulfilled that. This happened. God kept his merciful, wonderful covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Israel, and now even unto the Gentiles. It's the, it's the fullness of the fulfillment of God's promises. He also, Luke talks about that now that Christ has come, and this opens up, he alludes to it here in, uh, in Luke, and then really gets into it in the, the Acts, but that this is the age of the Spirit, that the Spirit of God is poured out upon us. That the long 400-year silence following Malachi, you know, God didn't speak through prophecy for 400 years. He's just quiet with Israel. Can you even imagine? That is a, that's, a long, that's a long time out right there. But now, as we see in, in, in Luke, that the Spirit of God begins to speak to Zechariah, to Mary, to Elizabeth, to Anna, and Simeon, and we see them praising God and prophesying, even as Christ is coming. We see that in the first and second uh, chapters, as God's moving, and, and the voice of God is coming alive. The prophetic anointing is coming upon the people, and suddenly God is speaking. He's, re- he's fulfilling the promises to Israel. The Holy Spirit has come. And then in Acts, of course, we see even more of that. Luke is awesome about and and does more in the area of that the gospel of the kingdom is for women, which in this day and age, praise God, is not that much of a shocker. It's like, well, duh, but... It wasn't a well duh before. Women were a, were a subclass citizen. You, you, you couldn't vote. Women couldn't be used as witnesses in a trial. Witness, women were treated like that it was their fault for the fall of man. I mean, just apparently an easy scapegoat. It's like, well, I can beat you up in the field, and so therefore I'm going to be the big one. I don't know. It was horrible for women. But Jesus came, and when Jesus came, he specifically worked with women, empowered women. And we see also, by the way, did you notice that Jesus Jesus came through a woman. It's kind of a huge deal, right? God needed a woman to help redeem the earth. That's a say law right there, and we still do. So this is a major part. This was a revolutionary way that Luke was writing to show what Jesus actually was doing when he brought freedom for all mankind. And that means humanity. That means women and men. Um, the, The gospel of Luke is also a gospel for the outcasts. And the theme of God's love for all people is very evident in this gospel. The, he, he references social outcasts, sinners, the poor. He points out Jesus' association with sinners and tax collectors and Samaritans. <laughs> so what is he doing? He's going across all racial, soci, socio-political lines. He's saying, this gospel of the kingdom is for everyone. And, and Luke really drills down on that. He's laying this out and, and, uh, and praise God for it. And then lastly, a gospel for all nations. I guess I just alluded to that. The key for Luke is the continuity of Israel with God and then the fulfillment of all the promises between Israel and God and how it then expands out to all the Gentiles. And so that's where it becomes a gospel for all nations that God is saying, Israel, it was your glory that the Christ would come through you and then through Christ, all of humanity would be saved. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. 
So that is what we are going to be up to for the next 12 weeks. Does that sound good? All right. Now, as I said, we're, we're hearing about this from Luke, who, who himself is a believer. He's come to saving faith in Christ, and then he's writing this account of Jesus, and, and our tribe is saying, Lord, we want to return to our first love. And when people hear the gospel of the kingdom and they first respond, it really is like, well, in light of that truth that I just received, how then shall I live? I've been presented now with the emperor of the universe, the creator of all things, who has come and not only said, let me tell you what's true, but has said, I am the truth. Like the definition of truth, that's, that's what I bring. I am the de definition of truth. Like, you don't have to ask me. It's not my opinion when I tell you what reality actually is. Jesus is like, I created reality. And it finds its basis in who I am. So when we're faced with that, the question is not like, oh, well, what I really believe, Lord, is blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. The question we're to answer is, okay, in light of being faced with the goodness of God, the reality of his love, and his definition of reality, how then shall I live? How then shall I respond? Will I continue to define my own reality in places where I'm like, Lord, you can have this, but this over here, I just, I just don't really dig the way you like to do that, Lord, you know. The fact that you have a choice is a gift from the Lord because of who he is, that he wants us to choose him, and he has given us about 80-something years to make that decision for how we want to live, if we want to live forever or if we want to face judgment. Now, I don't actually fully know, and I'm not going to go too deep into this right now, whether we just die right away when we go into the the pit of fire, like whether we just burn up. We know the pit of fire burns forever. We don't know if we suffer forever. I don't know. But the bottom line is, I don't want to die, right? Like, it's up to God whatever justice looks like for people who rejected Jesus Christ, his son, who left everything to save a bunch of guilty people, right? So whatever he wants to do with those that reject him, that's his business. But I do know this. He's the God that was so good that he gave his own life for us. So I'm pretty sure even his justice is really good. Can you receive that? All right, so let's put a pin in that. I didn't mean to bring up hell. It's not a very popular subject. But the point is that he's given us an opportunity to have eternal life with him. And in fact, Jesus said, this is eternal life that you know me. That you know me. So we get to know him right now. So then suddenly it's like, well, wait a minute. If eternal life is to know you, then that means that I can be known by you and to know someone, right? It, to know them is to know how they roll, right? I have brought Karen home a delicious cup of coffee that is just like the perfect temperature, the perfect cream, a little bit of sugar in it, just mm, mwah. And she hated it because she hates coffee. I never bring Karen coffee because I know Karen. Well, we're called to know God and to know that he goes, first of all, he says that Karen is wrong, that coffee is delicious. <laughs> but in regard to sin and righteousness, he's not confused. He's actually saying, this I love and this I hate. Are you with me? So if I want to love Karen, I'm going to bring her tea. Right? Why? Because I know this person. And for me to have a good life with her, I bring her tea. If I want to be rejected by her and wear coffee, because she's violent like that, just pray for me. That fear thing was, I'm just kidding. No, but, but can you receive that? That it's, God, how then shall we respond? And Luke is laying out what Jesus has said, and he's saying, you, you, you need to respond to what Christ, it, who he is and what he's done and what he says. Amen? Can you receive that? All right, so then let's, let's, let's just get down with Jesus here. Let's see what Jesus did and what he said. And we're going to start uh, in Luke 1. Oh, that is kind of small. Can you guys read that? All right. Okay. We might, uh, we might embiggen that next, next, uh, next week. Embiggen is a perfectly promulent word. So, all right. Let's, let's read this together. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to, to custom. And when the feast was ended... As they were returning the boy, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents 
did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. (laughs) Can you even imagine? I was just thinking like, I was just thinking like what Joseph and Mary must have been thinking, right? Because at this point, Jesus is 12. They, they had a dream to leave a certain place so that Jesus didn't get killed when he was two. Then they went to Egypt. There was another dream to go, to go back. Then there was another, in, you know, information from the Lord to go to Galilee instead of where they were headed that time. And so, you know, God's like fully involved to make sure that Jesus lives and stuff. And then <laughs> they lose Jesus. Can you imagine Mary and Joseph? They're like, oh, nuts. We just lost the Messiah. Lord, we lost the Messiah. You know, like, wouldn't that be horrible? When I was, when, when Mercy was like 14, 13, 13, she was 13. One time she did not come home from school. And, and I'm like, Karen, when is Mercy, Mercy coming home from school? She's like, well, she's usually home by now. I'm like, well, she's late. And the time keeps going. She's still late. And I'm like, golly, this is weird. Cause my girl, I mean, you know, she's not perfect, but she's close. And this is just not how she rolls, right? And so we're looking for her, and I'm like, I'm going to go to the school. So I go to the school. Hey, d- d- is Mercy here? Oh, no, I saw her leave, you know, at that point, like 35 minutes ago. And I'm thinking, oh, this is really freaky. So, okay, uh, Karen, think, where would she be? She's like, I don't know. This isn't like her. She's always on time. I'm like, I know. She's like, she's always on time. And that's actually making it worse because at this point you're like, I wish my girl was naughty and then I wouldn't be worried. I just know she's just up to natural naughty things, not like living in a trunk somewhere on her way to, I don't even know. You know, I'm just, it's like building and I'm like, oh, think good thoughts, think good thoughts. So I'm driving back and forth, looking all around. And anyway, uh, her friend, where she was, sees me drive by like, and then again, and then again, and their friend's like, um, is there any chance that your dad might not know where you are? Because he's driven by like three or four times. He looks, he looks really not, I think he's actually looking for you. And so she comes home and we're like, where were you? And that little rebellious little punk was, was doing life journaling at Max's, which she had told us that she would be with their friends studying the Bible at Max's the week before and we both forgot. And so anyway, I got her a cell phone that day. I did. I'm like, I never want to feel this again. I never want to feel that terror of like, where is my baby? Where's my girl? So I can only imagine how you would feel if you lost your baby and they were the Messiah. You're you're like, God is going to be so mad. (laughs) After three days, after three days, can you imagine three days? Ours was like an hour and 12 minutes of hell. Three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw them, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? He was 12. <laughs> I was just thinking of that this morning, that he probably was like, mom, quit embarrassing me in front of the synagogues. The Pharisees, mom. <laughs> I asked the Lord, I, I literally was like, Lord, Number one, is this joke going to be worth it? (laughs) And I didn't listen for that answer. But number two, (laughs) number two, is this going to make you mad? And I felt like he just laughed. He's like, I was 12, (laughs) right? This is the point that I want you to catch. Jesus was 12. Jesus, well, let's see what he has to say here. They didn't, oh no, he just said it. Okay, so, so Jesus understood, he's learning, and his mother and father have been teaching him, like, Jesus... Here's the thing. You're literally not like other boys. <laughs> You're the Messiah. I'm the Messiah? Yeah. Oh, what's that mean? And why are we speaking in English? Because I don't speak in Hebrew. So, <laughs> so they're raising him to understand this, and he's learning from the scriptures who he is and what it is that he's been called to fulfill. 
He's being mentored by his mom and dad. He's being mentored. He's had all of these prophetic acts that have happened through his life. The wise men have come. They had money to escape to Egypt because the wise men had come and gave them gold and frankincense and myrrh. It's like, hey, mom, what's that? Oh, that's frankincense. Well, what are we doing with that? Oh, that was given to us by these wise men from the east. Wow. Hey, mom, I just heard a rumor that like a bunch of kids got killed back around the time that I was like two years old, that everybody in that town, I remember you talking about, everybody got killed. Oh, yeah, Jesus, that's because Herod wanted to kill you when you were that age because you're the Messiah. So Jesus is learning how to be the Messiah. And he's 12 years old, and he knows that he's, to, he's supposed to be about his father's business. So he's at the temple, and he's talking with these people, and they're astounded at his wisdom because he's been growing in wisdom. He's been growing and, and learning, and he's been learning from his mother, and he's a good kid. And he's without sin, which for us as parents, like, let's just take a say law right there. Jesus had not sinned. He forgot to tell his parents where he was for three days. I know, right? All the mamas are like, I would, you know Jesus was getting spankings at some point, <laughs> but he didn't sin. <laughs> The point was that he was growing. And I, and I do feel like there's a say law for us as parents is to realize like your kids are growing. Some of the things that they're doing, that they're learning, that they're going through, you realize that Jesus' brain, his frontal lobe had to form just like our frontal lobes have to form. He didn't, it says that he emptied himself and became a, a human, a full human. And he had to learn from his mama. There's a say law for every kid in here. You need to learn from your mama. And tell her where you're going. <laughs> are you with me? But then we as moms and dads, we need to understand too, there are some things that's going on with our kids that's not sin. It's that we're forming character and training. And their frontal lobe, the prefrontal lobe, the long-term thinking unit is still forming. <laughs> and here's Jesus, forgot to tell his mama. Can you receive that? All the kids are like, yeah, mama, receive that. <laughs> All right, so let's come down to the point. What's the point here? They didn't understand the saying that Jesus spoke to them, and he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Now listen to this. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Listen to the key parts of this. Jesus submitted to them. Jesus knows he's Jesus. He knows he's the son of God. He's, in the, he's essentially at the highest echelon of political and spiritual power in Jerusalem, in the temple, with the smartest of smart thinkers who are astounded at the anointing and the call and the wisdom of this 12-year-old. And Jesus submits himself to his mother and father and goes back to Nazareth and grows in favor and stature and wisdom for 18 years. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out. Number one, it says that he increased in wisdom. What is necessary in order for something to increase in your life? Like, what does it mean? I mean, in order for it to increase, it would mean that it actually used to be smaller and then it got bigger. Jesus had to grow in wisdom and favor and stature not only with humans, which is really important, but also with God. Jesus had to do that. And he did it. And the reason why he had to do that is because he didn't have that wisdom, that stature, and that favor at the level that he would need when he was 30. If it's good enough for Jesus, is it good enough for you? 
Are you and I in a posture that we are submitted to the Lord and to one another for spiritual formation, that we would grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man? One of the most important things for us is that we have a teachable heart. Jesus said, a teachable heart is acceptable to me. He resists the proud, but he embraces the humble. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will exalt you. A wise man appreciates being rebuked, but a fool hates instruction. Who are you? Which one will you be? And Jesus grew up reading those things, so he knew, honor your mother and father. Honor your spiritual mothers and fathers. Honor your spiritual brothers and sisters. We are stirring each other up to good works. There is no scripture that's open to a personal interpretation that allows you to live a fruitless, sin-filled life. You and I are called to submit ourselves to God and to one another to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God. So I want you to decide if that's where you are. Let the Spirit of God search you and show you. We have that beautiful invitation in Psalms from David where he says, search me, O God. Show me if there's anything in me that's wicked. Show me if there's something in me that just kind of goes boink. Why? So that I can repent of it. Repent means turn from one thing unto another thing. Lord, if I am being headstrong, if I am choosing to define the terms of righteousness according to my current level of understanding and practice, God, give me the grace to repent and to begin to live according to who you are and to what you say. Give me the grace to submit myself one to another You know, you don't actually need, um, how how do I want to say this? I want to say it like this. You actually wouldn't need to come to, uh, you know, as it were, the professional, right? In this case, I guess I would put myself as like a professional, okay? My job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. If you have some questions like, I'm not really sure if um, this thing that literally is coming to your mind right now is actually in line with the Lord, and it's kind of bothered me a little bit, but I'm like, ah, I think it's okay. You don't even need to come to me about that. Go find anybody who actually reads their Bible and just ask them like, hey, I've been living like this. And I just want to be honest. I just want to submit myself to you for a minute because we can stir each other up to good works and look at the scriptures and read them together. Do you think this is okay? Like, do you think this is a good idea? And you'd be amazed the wisdom that that person will bring to you in light of the scriptures. Because the bottom line is, the reason why you're even mentioning it most of the time is because you already know it's not okay. (laughs) You just don't want to submit yourself to letting someone else bring light on that area. And I'm not even talking necessarily either uh, that it's always overtly sin. Sometimes it's just something that's lawful but not helpful. Are you with me? And sometimes it's just sin. Can you receive this word today? If Jesus will submit himself to those that are in his life for his own increase in wisdom, favor, and stature with God and men, then too, then also, then we too must, should, now do. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. (laughs) Uh, Thank you that I get to be humble so much more than I want to be. I pray that this would go deep in our hearts. I pray that we would be doers of this word and not just hearers. I pray that if there's any part of this that that, uh, is coming across as something other than the kindness of the Lord which leads to repentance, that, that you would forgive me and that you would set that right 
But Lord, I do ask that your kindness would lead us to repentance. And in the places where we are honestly living according to the philosophies of, of this world and of sin, and it's leading towards death, God, have, have mercy on us and convict our hearts so that we wouldn't continue to justify our own fruitless life, Lord, the places where we're being robbed by the enemy, the places where we're missing out on the fullness of what's available to be with you. God, give us the grace to turn from those things. And this year, Lord, as we're restoring and returning to our first love with you, that's what we ask, Lord. Give us the grace to be able to do that. It'll be more than words, but actions, conversations with you and others as we grow. That's our desire, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen.